Hey guys, Libby News here. So today I'll be doing my Kyoko Kirigiri character analysis. I've worked really, really hard on this, so I hope you guys enjoy. And before I get into the video, I do want to mention that I will be doing like a live stream pretty soon to celebrate over 30,000 subscribers. Thank you guys so much for that. That's absolutely insane. I'm still in shock that this channel ever got more than like over three subscribers, so <laughs> 30,000 is absolutely crazy. Thank you guys so much for the support. And I don't have an exact date set up yet. I'd like to do it either the 25th, 6th, or 7th but I'll let you guys know whenever I get a date. The main reason I wanted to mention this in this video is just because I was wondering if there was anything specific you guys wanted me to play, like a specific fan game that you think might be funny or some fan fiction you'd want me to read or something along those lines. So just leave me a comment or tweet me or something like that if you would uh, like to request something and I'll look at all of those. I may actually do this live stream on YouTube rather than Twitch, but I'll keep you guys updated on that. If it's on Twitch, I'll make a video giving the time and date and stuff. And if it's on YouTube, then I'll just set up one of those like reminder placeholder things until the stream. But I just wanted to keep you guys updated on that. Also, I will be referencing Dharmapa Kirigiri, the light novels, quite a bit, and also Dharmapa Zero. These titles aren't localized yet, so it's all based off of fan translated content. And I'll link those down below if you guys would like to read it for yourself. Also, there might be slight spoilers for Dharmapa Kirigiri in this analysis, but there's nothing very big or plot related revealed in this. It's mostly just family connections and stuff. Anyways, without further ado, let's go ahead and begin. So this whole thing starts with Jin and how I believe he was raised. It's implied in Dharmapa Kirigiri that Kyoko's grandfather Fuhito held the Kirigiri family tradition to an incredibly high degree, even so much to the point that he would put detective work over the life of a family member. And just a quick overview here, the Kirigiri tradition is basically that a Kirigiri detective must remain neutral in all cases. They must hide it in the shadow, show no bias towards good or evil, have no bias based on emotions, etc., so that they can can reach their absolute goal, which is to find the truth. It also implies that because of this, a Kirigiri detective should also refrain from having any significant emotional connections with others as it could impede their judgment. And I believe that Jin was raised with this idea in his mind. But it seems for Jin that he wasn't interested in the Kirigiri pride or detective work, but instead that he was interested in researching talent. Kadaka even admits to this in an interview saying that it's his unusual interest. And it's notable that on the Wikia page, it notes that he is the only one who seems to consider luck a talent as well, being the one who felt as if they couldn't let Kamida go in despair side. Like I said, I believe he was raised with this Kirigiri traditional mindset, but looking through the series, it's obvious he doesn't put his love for talent or the Kirigiri traditions above family or emotional connections. Examples being that he was hesitant to get Kyoko involved in discovering who the mastermind of the tragedy was, and even took her off the case after he believed it became too dangerous for her. And of course we know that at a very young age for Kyoko, her mother passed away and that her dad used her mother's death as an excuse to abandon her. I personally think that Kyoko got this idea in her head from her grandfather. In Dharma Kirigiri, we learn that Jin had already refused to become an heir for Fujito and that their relationship was rocky. Kyoko also mentioned in Dharmapa 1 that her father and grandfather had a big fight and that after the fight ended was when he abandoned her. There's no confirmation as to what the argument was about or exactly why he left, but I have a feeling it was more than likely about Kyoko becoming the next heir. But moving on, now that Jin is gone and out of Kyoko's life, we learn in Dharmapa Kirigiri that she was raised by her grandfather, who is a world famous detective who traveled the world solving cases and took Kyoko along with him until Japan passed a compulsory law that forced her to stay at home and attend school. Also, it's in Dharmapa Kirigiri that it's heavily implied that Fujito put detective work and finding the truth above anything else, including the safety of his family. So in a scene, Yui, the main character of Dharmapa Kirigiri, asks Fujito if he is alright allowing Kyoko to go with her to solve a very dangerous detective case. And he replies telling her that he would do anything to help Kyoko solve a case, even if it threatens her life. Kyoko sort of explains this to Yui a bit more later, stating that what it really means is that for Akira Giri, their work as a detective is far more important than the death of a family member. This is a doctrine that must be adhered to as if like a religion. To be honest, I don't think Jin is great at expressing emotions. Several examples of this can be seen in Dharmapa Zero when you read his thoughts of putting Kyoko first while he still keeps a poker face on on the outside. Even a lot of his interactions with Kizakura tend to come off a bit awkward to me. Like even when he's joking, he comes off very monotone 
tone or as if he still has a poker face on. And basically, again, I think he's like this because of the environment he grew up in. And even though he's not great at showing emotion, I definitely think he probably showed it a lot more than Fujito. So imagine Kyoko at this young, very impressionable age, having parents that did put emotions and family first before tradition, even if not amazing at expressing this, and her losing both almost back to back, and then going from this more normal environment to her grandfather, who like I said, puts the Kirigiri tradition above all. I'm sure Kyoko was confused, sad, and alone, feeling after both of these tragic events, even if she didn't fully understand what was going on. And like I said before, since it's sort of implied that having deep emotional bonds with others could hinder their neutrality, I personally believe that she had no one to comfort her during this time, and that more than likely her grandfather expressed that being over emotional is against the Kirigiri family tradition and tried to distract her with detective work rather than comforting her. He may have even mentioned that her father, the man who betrayed her, went against these traditions. I believe that this is one of the things that led her to become so independent and that this is one of the reasons why I think she hides her emotions so often. Like I said before, I believe she really looks up to her grandfather and does love being a detective and the Kirigiri tradition. This is why I think many of her lines in Dharma 1 resonate so much with her grandfather's, almost like she's trying to emulate him in a way. One example being that she tells Nagi that the Kirigiri family code is to uncover the truth at every cost. We represent neither justice nor evil, that is how we can uncover the absolute truth. We stand neutral in all things, and to do that we have to stand separate from the rest of society. Although this line is more so about how a Kirigiri detective must always be in the shadows, I feel like the always being in a place that is neutral part resonates closely to how Fihito said that they must put their work first, even at the cost of a family member's life, because you must not put emotions first or be swayed by any ways, good, evil, etc., to uncover the truth. You must remain neutral. Going back to Dangrapa Kirigiri, after her grandfather says that he's willing to do whatever he can to assist Kyoko in solving a case, no matter how dangerous, Kyoko implies to Yui that she has doubts regarding this. She questions Yui, asking if it is odd that her family does this, and Yui hesitantly explains that it is strange and asks Kyoko what she thinks about it. Kyoko states that she doesn't think of it as strange at all, but that could only be because she's convinced herself that it isn't, because if she doesn't think that way, she would end up feeling empty inside. This is the main line that implies to me that Kyoko was in fact sad, empty, alone feeling, etc. after her mother's death and father's abandonment, and that she wasn't properly comforted during this time because of the Kirigiri family code. I think that she didn't have anyone to comfort her growing up, and because she had no emotional outlet, she threw herself into detective work, hoping that she could fit in with the rest of her family and fill the void that her dad left her with. But Kyoko isn't like her family at all in the sense that she does feel emotion a lot, even though she tries considerably hard to cover it up. This also implies to me that she doesn't wish to be as independent as she seems, and she does want more of an emotional connection with others. Something a bit more than the very work-focused relationship she probably had with her grandfather. It also implies that this is the case in her shot through the heart event during school mode. In this event, she's lost in thought and when you negate the need Makoto thought and Nagi tells her that she doesn't need him because she's so independent, she actually has a bad reaction to it with the I don't think things went very well ending. And basically after that, she tells Nagi to not ask her to hang out again. And if you choose to agree with the need Makoto thought, she has a positive reaction and states that she's looking forward to his companionship. But moving on, even though she does care and respect her grandfather greatly, it's sort of implied in her free time event that the relationship didn't have a very deep emotional connection as well, since she tells Nagi that if you get too involved with someone, you're apt to lose any sense of good judgment. She mentions that she learned this lesson the hard way and that personal experience is a ruthless teacher. In this scene, she's actually referring to the burn marks on her hands that she covers up using her gloves. It's still unknown as to how she gained these burn marks on her hands, but thanks to Jinjo Jess on Tumblr, we can see that the Kirigiri novels are still continuing and that more than likely this bit of information will be included in the climax of the novel series, since we can see that her hands are not yet burnt. But this line implies to me that she's only fully trusted one person to this point, more than likely Yui Samadare, the protagonist of Dangrapa Kirigiri, and that she paid a heavy price for it. And since her grandfather is the one captured as her hostage in Ultra Despair Girls, it implies to me that her relationship with him stayed pretty static from childhood. And since Yui wasn't captured as her hostage, it either implies 
implies that something went awry in the relationship, which I sort of doubt because of something I'll mention later in the trivia portion of this video, or more than likely that something bad will happen to Yui at the end of the Danganronpa Kirigiri series because someone uses Kyoko's friendship with her against her. But that's just my personal opinion regarding it. Moving on a bit, I want to talk about her relationship with her dad. From the canon, we know that he abandoned her at a young age, and she mentions that she doesn't remember him well. She also tells Nagi that she feels nothing towards him, and that she only wants to see him in order to cut him off completely, and that the only reason she feels the need to do this is because she hates the fact that she had been pitied as the girl whose father abandoned her. Something else we know regarding this also is that she was willing to twist the Kirigiri code of hiding in the shadows in order to enroll at Hope Speak Academy and have this meeting with him. Personally, I think she's lying a bit here, or at least not telling the whole truth. I think she's being honest saying that she doesn't remember him well, but that she's lying about him not meaning anything to her, and that she's only doing this because of how she was pitied. My personal theory regarding this is that I believe the reason she conceals her emotions so and follows the Kirigiri code to a T, with a few exceptions, is because she wants to be as much like her grandfather as possible and as little like her dad as possible. Her grandfather is an honorable man who did the right thing and took her in and introduced her to detective work, something that has been the most fulfilling thing for her to do and has given her purpose while her dad left her with a hole in her heart. I think that she believes she can't follow the Kirigiri family code to a T because of this resentment she feels towards him and that she can't find that perfect neutral area the Kirigiri family strives for because she still holds resentment towards him for abandoning her. The Kirigiri way would be to take on any case and to have no bias towards good or evil, love or hate, but she knows that if her father was involved, her emotions would get in the way. Therefore, she feels as if he's holding her back from being a proper heir. So I think this could be the reason why she was so dead set on cutting him off and why she was even willing to twist the Kirigiri code to an extent just to face him. I also think the pitying line was more of her projecting her own thoughts of how she was abandoned. So maybe that she wasn't necessarily lying, but that to Nagi, she made it sound as if others were pitying her, but more so that she was pitying herself, feeling as if she could never escape from the mistakes her father made. It's also notable that in Danganronpa Zero, after the tragedy of Hope's Fee Academy, she was actually hired by her dad to investigate this case and uncover who the mastermind is. I personally believe that after being accepted into Hope's Peak Academy, she did confront her dad and tell him she was cutting off all ties with him and that she felt nothing towards him, and I think she would actually be excited to accept a case from him as a final way to prove that she can solve a case as a true neutral and not be swayed by how she feels towards him. It even implies that this is the reason through part of her conversation with Jin. But there is one scene in particular regarding this I want to focus on because I think it sort of parallels that scene in Dharma Kirigiri I mentioned before, where we see Fujito is glad to allow Kyoko to do anything she wants no matter how dangerous, and it's basically the opposite of this. And it's when Jin takes Kyoko off the case because he believes it's become too dangerous and he's worried about her safety. In this moment, it mentions that she's almost on the verge of tears. I think this could partially be because, as mentioned before in that scene in Dharma Kirigiri, it's sort of implied that she didn't have anyone looking out for her well-being and that she was attempting to fill this void by trying to become the greatest Kirigiri detective there was. But she felt that she couldn't even do that because of her abandonment issues and that empty feeling inside of her. So now having the person that left her with this emptiness finally doing what she always needed growing up all those years is sort of like a slap in the face in my opinion. So basically back then she needed that love and support to fill this void that she had, but no one was there. Later she found that detective work was partially filling it, but she still felt hindered by her emotions regarding her father. And now that she's finally cut him off and feels like she can move on, to see him do exactly what she always needed from him growing up has to be really emotionally confusing for her. It's like she's trying to finally let go of this resentment and now he's coming out and acting like he cares for her when she doesn't need that now. She needs to cut him out for good so that she can focus on her craft and be fulfilled in the same way that she sees her grandfather being fulfilled. Now I'd like to quickly talk about the dynamic between Nine and Kyoko and why I think they make such a good team, along with some reasons as to why this is my favorite ship. So throughout Dharmapa 1, we see that Kyoko is essentially still going by the Kirigiri family code, which is total neutrality and the willingness to put her own life and the lives of others on the line in order to uncover
uncover the truth. This seems to be the perfect course of action in trying to take down the mastermind and uncover the secrets of the school until chapter 5, when Junko begins trying to set her up for failure. In this case and in this trial, the truth which Kyoko is so gung-ho on finding and believes is always what's most important to accomplish isn't what's going to save her or Naegi since it's already rigged against them. So in this situation, she had to rely on the complete opposite of what personal experience and the Kirigiri family tradition had brought her up to believe. This being that she had to postpone the search for truth behind this case and trust her life to her friend Nagi. Something I find really interesting about these two is that they are complete opposite in terms of trust. Nagi believes in trusting everyone almost immediately, while Kyoko still is hesitant to trust others, even if they prove time and time again that they are on her side. In an interview with Kadaka, he mentions that he chose the idea of hope versus despair because they're polar opposites and you're able to move the player's heart in different directions using that sort of scale. So if Nagi represents pure hope and Junko represents true despair, then Kyoko is probably designed to be the pure neutral between them. I feel like him and her make a really good team because throughout the trials, when Nagi is too trusting and forgiving of the other classmates to suspect them, Kyoko is there to be the rational middle ground who looked at everything with as little bias as possible. Not to say that she wasn't affected or saddened by their deaths, it's implied several times throughout Dharmapal 1 that the deaths of their classmates hurt her as well, but that she was much more experienced in putting aside her emotions and thoughts of good versus evil in order to find the truth. And like I said, it seems as if this approach is the best way to figure out everything that happens in each trial and uncovering the mastermind until about chapter 5 and 6. And especially in the 6th trial, because in this situation, as Junko says, the truth is full of despair. So when not being able to rationalize which outcome was right or wrong, she had to come to realize that in some situations, it's impossible to be neutral or choose the correct outcome based off of facts. Staying in the school and living out the rest of their days there as her father wished may have seemed like the correct answer to make based off the knowledge known at the time, but obviously knowing the future events, at least until the ending of Dharmapa 3, we can see that choosing to leave was the correct choice for the most hopeful filled ending, even if there wasn't much evidence to see that future at the time. So in this situation, she had to have faith, hope, and most of all, trust the words of her friend Nagi. And this is what I believe she was referring to when she talks so highly about his optimism in Dharmapa 3. Something else that's notable about that scene at the end of her free time events is that she mentioned she can't imagine a time when she could trust someone enough to show them the burn marks on her hands. And of course, we know that she shows these burn marks to them in the sixth trial, acting as if she's alright with it, as long as it reveals the truth of the mastermind, again going back to the Kirigiri neutrality code. But in Dharmapa 3, she goes a step beyond this and actually touches him with her scarred hand, and considering this wasn't to uncover a truth, solve a case, etc., it was just simply to comfort and encourage someone that she considers to be close to her, I feel like for her character, it's an amazing moment because we finally get to see her trust someone completely and fully. And there's one last final thing I want to add in for the analysis portion. And this section might contain uh, implied spoilers for Dharmapa Zero, so if you're really sensitive to spoilers, just go ahead and skip to the time shown on the screen. For those of you who are still here, so in Dharmapa 1, we all know that Junko erased Kirigiri's memory of her talent and why she came to the school. And I didn't really think too much of it before, but after making this video, I realized just how big of a burden this was for her in Dharmapa 1, seeing as absolutely everything regarding her past has to do with her talent as a detective. In her free time events, she admits that she can't even remember who she was living with, which we know now is her grandfather, but to me, it really just goes to show how much of a threat Junko considered Kyoko to her plan if she was willing to take so much more away from her than the others. I really feel for Kyoko since in her Shot Through the Heart event as well, she seems just completely lost. She tells Nagi that her greatest fear is what she's already forgotten, and to me, it's crazy how she was still able to focus on the cases for what they were and uncover the truth without letting her suppressed fear and anxiety consume her. To me, it just shows how strong of a character she really is. I also find that her talent is oddly similar to Junko's in a way as well, but more so that Kyoko uses her analytical abilities to keep the world at balance by not siding either way, while Junko uses her to twist the world in the way that she pleases. But this was just a thought I wanted to share with you guys. 
guys. But that will conclude the analysis portion of the video, so let's go ahead and move on into the trivia. And as always, a vast majority of this I am getting off of the Wikia page. The name Kyoko is composed of echo or ringing and also child. Her name fits her composed quiet speech and how during the trial she more than once guides Makoto to conclusions she has already reached herself and lets him be the one to voice them. Kirigiri in kanji means fog cutter, referring to her detective background. In the beta version of Darampa, Kyoko was named Gyaru Kirigiri and was the first victim. And hopefully I pronounced that word right this time. I know I made a lot of you guys cringe when I tried to say it in my Junko analysis. In the very first trailer for Ultra Despair Girls, the creators tried to troll their fans by making it look as if it was a happy, fun sports game before revealing the actual title. And in this, they made Kyoko a basketball player. On the wiki, it states the reason Kyoko was assigned this particular sport is probably because her Japanese voice actress is known for her role in the basketball theme series Rokubu. Also, if you guys would like to see this trailer, the only version I found of it online is a fan dub, which I thought they did a really good job, and I'll link that video down below. Similarly to most of the main characters in Darampa, Kyoko is included in the collaboration of Darampa 3 and Gun Girl Z. The Rose and Vitro item you can give to Kirigiri for one of her most positive reactions references the Rose and Vitro that the protagonist of Darampa Kirigiri, Yui, gives to her as a gift. This is the main reason why I think Yui will probably die or something bad will happen to her at the end of Darampa Kirigiri, since if they weren't on good terms, as I said, could have been the case before. I have a feeling Kyoko would have responded negatively to this. And last but not least, the wiki page notes that the studs on Kirigiri's gloves are inconsistent on many occasions. Every sprite from the first game consistently shows them in a 2x4 arrangement, but the anime and official art create different patterns. Her anime concept design shows them in a 3x3 pattern, and official art shows them on more than one occasion in a 3x4 arrangement. But this will conclude the video. I hope you guys enjoyed. Like I said, I worked really, really hard on this. <laughs> and even with this video being like super long as it is, there was still a good bit of stuff that I felt like I left out. So it's kind of like the Fukawa one where I feel like I could honestly do like a sequel <laughs> at some point. Also a lot of the times when I do these videos I like to look up other analysis stuff online after I do my own and kind of like compare and contrast and see what other people say and generally I like to reference them in the video at one point but um, there was one for Kirigiri that I'm gonna link down below and I didn't really find anywhere to reference it in the video but uh, I felt like they covered a lot of stuff in this analysis that I didn't get around to like they focused a lot on analyzing Kirigiri in Darnipal 1 as I kind of focused more on her childhood and trying to like come up with theories about that. So if you're left unsatisfied with mine and you want to know more about Kirigiri because there is just so, so much to learn, I will link that analysis post down below. Admittedly for this analysis, I um, only read the summaries for the first two volumes for Dharma for Kirigiri. I couldn't find the third volume summary and I found the fourth volume as I was like almost done making the analysis. So I kind of grazed through it and added it in in a couple of places but wasn't really able to read it to the fullest. So if there's anything from the third or fourth or fifth volume that I totally just like missed out on that was very important you felt like and I should have had it in the analysis, I do apologize. Feel free to leave it down below in the comment section. But again, I did try my best with this and it was admittedly a very hard analysis compared to some of the other ones I've done. But anyways, I do hope you guys enjoyed the video. Like I said, I'll try to do that live stream pretty soon and I'll probably do another trivia video after that because you guys seem to really enjoy the last one, which I was super happy about because those videos are a lot of fun. But anyways, I hope you guys did enjoy the video and I will see you real soon. Subscribe to Weeby News for more hope-filled videos.